So our next topic is uh, building surfaces as quotient topological spaces. So let's start by defining quotient topological spaces. So we suppose that X is a topological space and twiddle is an equivalence relation on X. We write X divided by twiddle to be the set of equivalence classes, square brackets, little x, the points little x and big X. And then we write pi going from x into x divided by twiddle for the surjective projection pi taking a point little x to its equivalence class. Uh, so thus much works if x is just a set. Uh, we're now going to use the topology on x. So the quotient topology on the quotient space x divided by twiddle is defined by saying that a set u uh, in x divided by twiddle is open if and only if its inverse image pi inverse of u containing x uh, is open in big X. So uh, let me warn you that if your equivalent relation twiddle is badly chosen then your question topological space x mod twiddle may not be a nice topological space. In particular, it may have rather few open sets uh, because the condition for a set in x mod twiddle to be open uh, is that its pre-image in x is open in x. So um, if the equivalence relation is kind of badly aligned with the topology on x, then you end up with rather few open sets in x mod twiddle. Now one of the things this affects is Hausdorffness, because for a topological space X to be Hausdorff, you need enough open sets to separate uh, any two distinct points. So X Hausdorff does not imply that the quotient space X mod twiddle is Hausdorff. That's something you have to check. So in fact, you can show that the quotient space X mod twiddle is Hausdorff if and only if the graph of the equivalence relation, that is the set of points uh, of pairs of points x comma y in the product x cross x uh, for which x equivalent is equivalent to y. So x mod twiddle is Hausdorff if and only if this graph of the equivalence relation is a closed subset of the product topological space x cross x. Uh, one useful thing to know is that if x is compact then the quotient moduli space x mod twiddle is compact. OK, let's take an example. Um, first, let's take x to be the closed interval, closed interval 0, 1. So we're going to define an equivalence relation twiddle on x uh, by x is equivalent to x for all points little x in 0, 1, and also 0 is equivalent to 1, and 1 is equivalent to 0. So that definition uh, defines an equivalence relation on 0, 1. Uh, and x mod twiddle is in fact the circle with the usual topology. So what's going on here is we are in effect, we're identifying the point 0 with the point 1, so we're kind of gluing 0 to 1. If you think about it visually, start with 0, 1 as a, a really straight line, a closed interval, bend it round so that 0 is next to 1, and then glue 0 and 1 together. So you can see now that what we get is a circle, topologically. We don't need any notion of smooth structure, so we don't care if there's a kind of corner here or not. We're only working with topological spaces. Um, as a second example, uh, let's take x is the, the square, not one squared, in the plane, unit square. Um, and we define an equivalence relation twiddle on x by uh, x comma 0 is equivalent to x comma 1 and 0 comma y is equivalent to 1 comma y uh, and that has to be true for all x uh, for this one and for all y for this one. Okay now here I'm already being lazy because uh, if that is all there was that would not define an equivalence relation uh, on 0 1 squared because by definition an equivalence relation has the properties that, well, a point is always equivalent to itself, 
Um, and if x is equivalent to y, then y is equivalent to x. And if x is equivalent to y, and y is equivalent to z, then x is equivalent to z. So it has to be um, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Now, what I've written down here doesn't have those properties, uh, but if you just write down some relations in an equivalence relation, uh, that all, you can always generate an equivalence relation from them uh, by uh, defining Twiddle to be the weakest equivalence relation, which includes these relations. So if you think about an equivalence relation as a subset of x cross x, then um, I'm saying my equivalence relation is the intersection of all equivalence relations, sort of as subsets of x comma x, which contains these points, or the set of pairs of points which I specify. Um, okay, so in this case, an x comma zero is equivalent to x comma one also implies that x comma one is equivalent to x comma zero, and so on. You can swap these two around. Um, actually, if we think about what happens at the vertices, then uh, if you glue this point to that point and that point to that point, then actually all four uh, vertices end up being equivalent um, if you combine this relation and that relation. So 0, 1 is equivalent to 1, 0 and so on. Uh, okay, so let's draw this as the square. So there's a square in the xy plane. There's 0, 0. Uh, there's 1, 0. There's 0, 1. There's 1, 1. And um, Okay, the, the relation x comma zero is equivalent to x comma one means that this bottom side of the square here is identified with this top side of the square here. Um, and I write that by, I'm writing a single arrow on uh, this square, uh, on, on that edge, and uh, another a matching single arrow on that edge, and they're pointed in the directions in which they're being identified. So our convention is that if you have a, a polygon with two end sides and two of the sides have the same kind of arrow drawn on them, uh, then we identify those sides and we identify them in the direction uh, that both of the arrows are pointing. So this edge in that direction gets identified with that edge in that direction. Uh, this relation 0y is equivalent to 1y uh, means that we identify this vertical edge here with that vertical edge there. And I've drawn a different kind of arrow with two arrow heads here, and they're going, uh, they're being identified both in the upwards direction, so I've drawn it like that. Okay, so that's how we present um, equivalence relations of the kind we're going to, to look at visually. Um, we draw a polygon, and we, in for pairs of sides, we can have um, draw arrows of different kinds on the pairs, and then we identify them. Like that. So then, in this case, x mod twiddle is a surface, which is homeomorphic to t2, which is s1 squared. Um, now, when you define a quotient topological space, you don't have to get a surface. Um, it's just that we've chosen a particularly nice kind of equivalence relation which, which does give us a surface. Um, if you think about what this is visually, um, x mod twiddle is a surface, surface homeomorphic to t2, which is s1 squared. Um, so I've drawn a picture here of a torus uh, as uh, the American kind of donut, which has a hole in the middle. Um, and there's one vertex uh, and two edges. Here's the edge with um, single arrows. There's the edge with double arrows. And you think about if you think about taking the surface of the torus and cutting it along here and along there, you can unfold it to a rectangle, which will look like this. Um, okay, so now later in the lecture I'm going to define uh, some notation which will describe this diagram as A, B inverse, A inverse, B. So that's why I've written these green things um, on the square. Um, and when we come to that, I'll explain what these labels mean. Okay, so the reason why um, x mod twiddle is the torus is that actually uh, you can handle uh, the uh, the x coordinate as a naught one mod twiddle, where that equivalence relation just identifies naught and one, and then the uh, 
the y coordinate as 0, 1, again, divided by its own equivalence relation. So x mod twiddle is um, s1 times s1, really, by the first example. Um, so really the equivalence relation I took on 0, 1 squared is the product of an equivalence relation on the first 0, 1, which identifies 0 and 1, with the equivalence relation on the second, y 0, 1, which identifies 0 and 1. Okay, so here's how we convince ourselves that x mod twiddle is a surface, or at least convince ourselves that x, that it's the quotient topological space is locally homeomorphic to R squared. So um, let's consider, for example, uh, a point here on uh, the y-axis part here. So this point there gets identified with uh, the opposite point on the other side. Um, so in the square, we can take an open neighbourhood, which I've labelled A, which is a, a semicircle with a closed edge here, and let's say an open edge there. There's a matching um, open neighbourhood of the identified point on the other side, which is this uh, semicircle B. So when we glue together that region and that region, then in the glue together thing, the B and the A part uh, get glued along this uh, interval to make uh, a disk. So in the identified topological space, this point here on the side ends up having an open neighbourhood which is in homeomorphic to an open neighbourhood in R2. Okay, so therefore the point 0 comma little y divided by the equivalence relation has an open neighbourhood homeomorphic to this open ball in R2. Let's consider the same thing with the vertices. Um, now in this case all four of the vertices of the square get identified to a single point in our question topological space T2. So these four points have um, open neighbourhoods, uh, each of which is a quarter circle, so A, B, C and D. So when you glue together these si that side with that side, and this side with this side, you end up gluing together these four quarter circles into a whole circle. So therefore the point 0, 0 or twiddle has an open neighbourhood here, uh, the, the glued together version of these four open neighbourhoods in the square, which is also homeomorphic to a ball, an open ball in R squared. So therefore the quotient topological space is uh, locally homeomorphic to R squared, which is the first condition in being a surface. Uh, the second, second condition was is being Hausdorff, which you maybe have to work a bit har harder to convince yourself is true. Okay, so in this case, all four vertices of the square x are identified in the quotient topological space. Um, that's not completely obvious, it's a sum you have to do, and we'll see uh, similar things in which uh, vertices get identified in different ways. So, um, our third example um, is we again take the square at 0, 1 squared, but now we're going to identify the sides in a different way. We'll identify the top side uh, here, labelled A, with the right-hand side, uh, and we do it uh, in such a way that this direct the the rightwards direction gets identified with the upwards direction there. Uh, so I, I mean, I we're also going to identify the bottom side, which I'm labelled B, um, with the left-hand side, uh, which is labelled B inverse, and um, we do that in such a way that the rightwards orientation of this side is identified with the upwards orientation of that side. Now, you could do this with a piece of paper and sellotape. Um, basically, if you took your piece of paper and you kind of fold it over loosely along this diagonal, and then you sellotaped that edge to that edge, and this edge to that edge, you get a shape which um, is topologically a two-sphere. Um, if you imagine taking a, a square of pastry um, and uh, putting a bunch of um, peas and things inside and then folding it over uh, along uh, that diagonal um, and pinching together the edges there and there, what you get would be a samosa. Um, so here I've drawn a two-sphere and in the surface of the two-sphere I've drawn my two edges here and the vertices. So the vertex 0, 0, uh, which is there, I've drawn here. 
Here I've drawn the vertices 0, 1 and 1, 1, uh, and 1, 0 rather, which is there and there. These two vertices get identified. Over there I've drawn the fourth vertex 1, 1, and the um, because I've glued them, these two edges now appear as one edge in this two sphere. Those two edges again appear as one edge there. So if you think about taking a two sphere, you draw uh, these three vertices, those two edges in it, then you cut the two sphere along that edge and along this edge and open it out. Um, what you'll get is basically a square with four edges, two from here, two from there, and four vertices, one vertex from there, one vertex from there, and two vertices from here. Okay, so you can you can cut a two sphere um, and unfold it into a square like that. Okay, so note that in this case we don't identify all four edges. In that case, this edge is only identified with itself. Uh, sorry, this face is only this vertex is only identified with itself. That vertex is only identified with itself. These two vertices get identified as a pair. Okay, uh, let's move on to a fourth example. Again, we're going to take the square uh, here. We're identifying sides in pairs, but now we're identifying opposite sides with the opposite direction. Um, so, for example, this or this identification here with that, uh, you get that by saying that the point uh, x comma zero in the bottom side is identified with the point one minus x comma one in the top side. So I'm identifying y coordinate zero and one, but in order to reverse the directions of the edges, I take the x coordinate here to one minus x over there, and for the B, for the vertical sides, B sides, um, again I identify them in the opposite direction. So at 0, y here gets identified with 1, 1 minus y over here. So we reverse the directions. So in this case, it turns out that the four vertices get identified in pairs. So that vertex gets identified with this vert vertex, 0, 0 is equivalent to 1, 1. Uh, and 0, 1 is identified with 1, 0. Okay, so uh, the quotient topological space x mod piddle is a surface. It's not obvious, but it's true. Um, it's a, a surface which is called the projective space, RP2. Um, so if you know about projective spaces in algebra or algebraic geometry, uh, this is the space of one-dimensional vector subspaces of the three-dimensional vector space R3. This is a surface which has the property of being non-orientable. Uh, we'll explain that in a later lecture. Um, one way of describing RP2 is as a two-sphere divided by plus or minus one. Um, so where plus or minus one identifies the point x and y and z in the two-sphere with minus x, minus y and minus z. So we, we identify our typical points in the two-sphere. So one way to think about this, uh, think about R2, as being a half-sphere in which opposite points on the equator are identified. So if we took S2 to be the, the whole sphere here, um, so we fill in the top thing as well, then the effect of uh, dividing by plus or minus one is that each point in the northern hemisphere gets identified with a point in the southern hemisphere. So I, so I can throw away the northern hemisphere, Think about this thing as just the southern hemisphere, and then I identify the opposite points on the equator there. Um, so really I'm thinking about this square as you kind of deform the sides outwards so it becomes a circle or a hemisphere, and then arranged around the equator here are the four vertices and the four edges, um, with single arrows there and there, double arrows there and there. Okay, so it's difficult to visualize um, RP2 as a topological surface because it's something that cannot be embedded in three-dimensional space R3 uh, because it's, uh, it's compact, but it's not orientable. Um, so compact surfaces can only be embedded in R3 when they are orientable. Um, so later on, uh, we'll find that a surface is orientable if it has a consistent notion of clockwise um, at every point. 
In this case, there is no consistent notion of clockwise because you started here with some notion of clockwise, you deformed it across there, and you went through that identification, it would turn into anti-clockwise. Uh, okay. Um, our fifth example, um, again, we're taking a square, um, and we're identifying sides. This time we identify the vertical sides in kind of the parallel direction. So the vertical sides are being both identified upwards, but the horizontal sides uh, are being reversed in direction. So the horizontal side pointing in that direction is being identified with the other side pointing in the opposite direction. So this will give us an equivalent relation. X comma zero is identified with one minus X comma one. Whereas this gives us the equivalence relation what 0, y is identified with 1, y. Okay, it turns out that in this equivalence relation, all four vertices get identified with each other. If you start with that vertex, then this identification identifies with that vertex, then that identification identifies with this vertex, and then this identification again identifies with that vertex. So the quotient topological space x mod twiddle is something called the Klein bottle. Okay, it's rather like a torus. However, uh, it is non-orientable, and you can't embed it in in R three. Um, now, I've tried to draw here. Um, oops, um, I've tried to draw a Klein bottle in R three. Um, as I said, you can't embed it in R3, but you can uh, put it into R3 in such a way that it intersects itself. So this red circle here is a kind of self-intersection in R3. So you can imagine a, a demented glass blower trying to construct a bottle like this. So I've drawn it kind of a bit like a wine bottle on, on its side. There's the neck of the bottle. Now the, in the bottom of the, of the bottle, the, the tube kind of comes up passes through the side of the bottle and then gets connected to the neck. You can imagine that if you tried to uh, to fill this bottle up, um, then uh, somehow the wine would all go on the floor because um, the inside of the Klein bottle is the same as the outside, if you neglect the fact that uh, this has a sense of intersection. Okay, so um, we've had uh, several examples. Um, examples two, uh, three, and four and five were all made by taking the square and identifying uh, sides in pairs in different ways. Uh, these four surfaces uh, in examples two through to five, uh, giving you the two sphere, the projective plane, the, the torus, and the Klein bottle, are all different, that is, not homeomorphic uh, surfaces. Okay, so we don't need to work with squares um, if we want to build surfaces. Uh, one way of doing it is to take any polygon X in the plane, which has an even number of sides, and then identify the sides in pairs. Um, and it turns out that X mod twiddle uh, will always then be a compact surface. So you need an even number of sides because otherwise you couldn't identify sides in pairs without having uh, one side left over at the end. So, um, you have to do a little bit of work to decide uh, which um, subsets of the vertices get identified. So here I've written an example um, of a hexagon. Um, so here I've decided to identify this diagonal side here with the opposite diagonal side in the same direction. I'm identifying this side here with that side there, uh, where, okay, that clockwise uh, it's going with that clockwise direction. And I'm identifying the bottom side here with this upper left diagonal side there. Okay, so I've got six vertices and I've labeled little open neighborhoods of them as A, B, C, D, E, and F. Now let's see what happens to the vertices. Um, so here, if you look at this thing A, so A has an incoming side with two double arrows. Uh, the other vertex which has an incoming uh, side with two double arrows is this vertex C here. So I've put A next to C in this picture. Um, 
So the other edge on C is this thing with the incoming triple arrows. The other uh, vertex with an incoming triple arrow is F, so I put the F next to C, and you can go, uh, you can keep doing this all the way around, and it turns out that all six of these open neighborhoods of vertices get glued together in a circle. Um, so that means that all six of these vertices of this hexagon get identified. So every point in the quotient topolo topological space X mod twiddle looks either like that, that is it's a point in the interior of the hexagon surrounded by a small disk, or it looks like this, that is it's a point in the interior of one of these edges, and then once you've done the identification you have a disk which is divided into uh, two halves, or uh, your point is one of the six vertices, and then after identification you get um, basically kind of six sectors coming together, um, and in each case uh, what you get is a disk. So uh, every point of the quotient topological space is um, has an open neighborhood open to an open I'm homeomorphic to an open neighborhood in R2. Um, so it's also Hausdorff, which is not quite as easy to see, but it's true. Um, and it, therefore the quotient topological space X mod twiddle is a surface. And it's compact because X is, we started with a closed hexagon, it's a closed bounded set in R2, and so it's compact. Um, and any quotient topological space of a compact topological space is compact. So uh, let's take another example, um, also starting with a hexagon, um, uh, but with different side identifications, so that side's identified with that side, this side's identified with that side, and so on. Um, now in this example, it turns out that the vertices are identified in two groups of three. So let's start with this vertex A, it's labelled in pur purple, it's got um, an outgoing single arrow side. The other place with an outgoing single arrow side is E here. So A gets next to E, um, and then E gets next to C, and the C gets next to A again. So the, it turns out these three um, vertices and these three purple neighborhoods get glued together to make a single disk, um, whereas the remaining three also get glued together to get a single disk. So the way I've done it, actually, um, the purple things have all of the outgoing arrows, uh, and the red things have all of the incoming arrows. So in this example, vertices are identified in two groups of three. Um, so it's being able to do this calculation is going to be important uh, later on when we talk about Euler characteristics of surfaces. You need to be able to um, work out which groups vertices are identified in in order to compute the Euler characteristic. Okay, so let me go over again how to do the calculation uh, of which groups of vertices get identified. So in this example, we have to identify uh, the edges, um, what well, the kind of vertex and edge uh, at A with the vertex and edge at E, because um, that side is being identified with that side. So I can draw myself a little picture of the A thing and the E thing, uh, and they get glued together as those red arrows do. Um, so um, partway through the calculation of which vertices get identified, I would draw myself a picture which had A and E next to each other, and I'd draw the arrows, um, the number of arrowheads and which direction they're pointing. So you carry on doing this until it... So you start at E, and the E thing with outgoing triple edge gets identified with the C thing without going triple edge, so C gets drawn there, and actually then the C gets identified with A, so the thing closes up. Um, so then you've got one group of vertices identified by the equivalence relation, and then you can do that for all uh, of the groups of vertices, or sets of vertices identified by the equivalence relation. Uh, one more thing, uh, we can allow curved sides to our polygons, so for example you can have a, a two-gon, um, which is a um, a disk with, with two curved edges. Uh, I've drawn it here so that I'm going to identify uh, the top edge with the bottom edge in that direction. Uh, that identification gives you the two sphere S2. 
Um, whereas if you identify them in the opposite direction, you get uh, RP2. In this case, the two vertices remain distinct. In this case, the two vertices get identified. Okay, so in all of the um, diagrams of um, polygons with side identifications I've drawn you so far, uh, I've had notation in green with things like A, A inverse, and so on. Um, let me now explain this notation. Uh, it's some notation for describing polygons with uh, side identifications in a very succinct way. So the idea is that we label each side by little a, little b, little c, or little a inverse, little b inverse, little c inverse, and so on. So identified sides get the same label a or b or whatever. Uh, so this means so this side is being identified with that side, so they both have a label a, um, although one of them is an inverse. This side is getting identified with that side, so they both have a label b. This side is getting identified with this side, so they both have a label c. Now then, the other thing we want to specify is the direction of the arrows. Um, so I'm thinking about this. Here is a disk uh, sitting in the plane. There is clockwiseness or there's anti-clockwiseness. So each edge has arrows on it, which can be, be pointing in a way which is either going clockwise around the disk or anti-clockwise around the disk. So in this case, so the idea is that um, sides in which the arrows are going clockwise around the disk are labelled A and B and C and so on without an inverse. Sides in which the arrows are going anti-clockwise around the disk uh, have an inverse. So in this example, uh, the side A is going clockwise around the disk as is the side B. This side C inverse is the, the arrows are pointing anti-clockwise. So um, we write up an inverse there, again inverse here, uh, but that's clockwise. Okay, so that's how given uh, a polygon with side identifications, we just draw labels on each side. Having done that, we choose some vertex, I've labelled it in green, and then we list the labels on the sides in the clockwise direction, starting from the vertex. So here we get A, B, C inverse, A inverse, C, B. So we just write this as a word, A, B, C inverse, A inverse, C, B. So then this word, uh, basically completely describes this polygon with side identifications. Um, and the rule is that labels A and B and C and so on always appear twice in, in the word. Okay, so um, a two-ingon with side identif identifications in pairs in this way is, some, is called a planar model for a surface. Um, so the planar being coming from the plane or coming from a polygon in the plane. And it's a very succinct way to describe surfaces. Um, so, you know, you can just say A, B, C inverse, A inverse, C, B, and then from that you can draw this diagram and you can write down the side implications um, and you kind of do the gluing, you get a compact surface. Um, so, different words uh, can describe the same, that is homeomorphic surfaces, and it's not a trivial exercise to decide when they do. Uh, you know, you can describe the same surfaces with um, identifications of probably very much arbitrary length, uh, and so on. Um, you should note that the vertex where you start uh, is arbitrary, so if, it, if I'd started uh, instead of that vertex, I would have got the words C inverse, A inverse, C, B, A, B, rather than that. So cyclic permutations of the symbols in your uh, word don't make any difference uh, to the, I think. So let's go back and look at a few uh, other examples. So here, for example, um, I've drawn side identifications like this, and my word, I've chosen to start at that vertex, my word goes A, B, C inverse, A inverse, C, B. That describes this, um, this polygon, and uh, so here's RP2 is given by A, B, A, B. Um, the Klein bottle is given by A, B inverse, A, B. And um, S2 can be written as A, A inverse, B, B inverse. Um, but uh, later on, we saw that S2 can also be written by the word A, A inverse. So that's two 
different uh, words describing S2. Here the RP2 can be given, written as AA or as um, uh, ABAB, for example.